Carrying on from part one, I'm going to talk about methane as a greenhouse gas, as well as nitrous oxide. This leads on to the impact climate change is having upon our beautiful coral reefs. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas, 28 to 36 times more effective than carbon dioxide at trapping heat in the atmosphere. In the modern atmosphere, methane concentrations have risen by more than 150% since 1750. There are six major sources of atmospheric methane and I will discuss each one in turn. Biomass burning is the burning of dead or alive material from forests, savannas, grassland, agriculture waste and the burning of fuel wood. The complete combustion of biomass produces carbon dioxide and water vapour, which if you remember, are both global warming gases. However, complete combustion does not occur, so other carbon compounds such as methane and carbon monoxide are produced. The flaming phase of a fire gives almost complete combustion, whereas the smouldering phase does not, and so more methane is produced during this phase. Forest fire burning typically burns for an hour or less, followed by a smouldering phase that can last a day or more. So producing a lot of methane. For savannah, grassland and agriculture waste, the flaming phase lasts a few minutes and the smouldering phase lasts up to an hour. Biomass burning accounts for 5-15% to of global annual emission of methane. This has increased over time and whilst not a huge percentage at the moment, if it continues to rise it may become more important on a global scale in the future. Landfill sites also produce methane. Initially, the decomposition of waste occurs aerobically, that means with oxygen, but within a year anaerobic decomposition starts to occur, which produces methane. Landfill gas is composed of roughly 50% methane and 50% carbon dioxide. This methane can be captured and used as a renewable energy source to produce electricity. This is carried out in some places, but more still needs to be done. According to a recent study by NASA, the oil and gas industry is largely responsible for an increase in global methane emissions. When an oil well is being exploited, the gas is inevitably released at the same time as the oil that is being pumped. It is possible to capture this methane and, depending on its quality, has a number of uses. Worldwide, it is most often used for power generation, district heating, boiler fuel or town gas, or it is sold to natural gas pipeline systems. Again, this happens in some places, but still more could be done. Significant amounts of methane are lost during both extraction and transfer of methane above ground. It is estimated, for example, that in the 1990s, around 6% of the methane piped across Russia was lost due to leaks. More effective collection techniques and better maintained transfer pipelines could all help to reduce incidental methane emissions. Methane can also be released from coal and surrounding rot strata due to mining activities. In underground mines, this can be hazardous to miners, so is removed through ventilation systems. In abandoned mines and surface mines, methane might also escape to the atmosphere through natural fissures. Again, this could be captured and used. It has been known for some time that waterlogged rice paddy fields are a major contributor to global warming. Anaerobic decomposition of organic material in flooded rice fields produces methane, which escapes to the atmosphere. This production of methane is due to water blocking oxygen from penetrating the soil, creating ideal conditions for the anaerobic bacteria which go on to produce methane. This process is called methanogenesis. Some research points to the moment when rice production took off in Asia, about 5,000 years ago, because methane concentration, recorded in tiny bubbles of ancient air trapped in ice cores in Antarctica, rose rapidly at this time. Upland rice fields are not flooded, so do not produce significant quantities of methane. However, they only account for approximately 10% of global rice production. 90% of rice fields are wetland rice, consisting of irrigated, rain-fed and deep water rice. Overall, methane from growing rice contributes to 5-20% to of anthropogenic methane emitted. Research has been carried out to find ways to reduce methane emissions from rice growing, and at first it seems easy enough. The longer the flooding lasts, the more bacteria build up. Almost any farming method that reduces or interrupts the period of flooding can reduce methane production. Farmers could follow a sequence of wetting and drying which could prevent methane from building up and could reduce emissions by 90%. Chinese and Japanese farmers typically drain their rice paddies once during the middle of the growing season because they have found it increases yields. It also means that water can be conserved. However, there is a big issue around the ability to control water well enough to ensure both wetting and drying. Even in California, 
farmers are reluctant to try this out as their fields are so large and irrigation delivery is too slow to assure farmers that they can wet and dry their fields as necessary. So unfortunately this is not going to change soon, but it is a possibility and scientists are working hard to develop systems to meet the diverse needs of farmers from different areas. Another issue is that research has shown that intermittent irrigation of rice paddies significantly stimulates nitrous oxide emissions. This is another greenhouse gas. With intermittent irrigation, up to 45 times more nitrous oxide was produced than constantly flooded fields. Although, it has been found that very short anaerobic aerobic cycling may induce a very low emission of nitrous oxide. Obviously more research needs to be completed to find the optimum duration of the flooding and drying cycle that produces the least amount of methane and nitrous oxide. Methane is also produced by cattle and other ruminants. There are currently 1.4 billion cattle in the world. With the growing demand of cheap beef and dairy food, that number is increasing. Together with other grazing animals, they contribute about 40% of the annual methane budget. Ruminants produce methane due to the bacteria that are in their gut. These microbes help them to break down their food and absorb nutrients and produce methane as a waste product. This process is called methanogenesis and is the same one as found in rice paddy fields. The waste methane is expelled by the animal either as a burp or flatulence. That's a posh name for a fart. Scientists are looking at ways in which to reduce methane emissions by cattle and one intriguing way is selective breeding. There are different types of microbes found in the gut of cows and some produce less methane than others. These microbes have been shown to be passed from one generation to another, so cows could be bred to have lower methane emissions. Also, young animals could be inoculated with a low methane microbiome, which scientists believe will persist throughout life, which could lead to animals producing much less methane. The quality of the food eaten by cows is also a factor in the amount of methane produced by cows and is potentially another way to reduce methane emissions. Methane is also produced by permafrost melting, but I'm going to talk in detail about that in the next instalment when I look at the impact of climate change on our polar regions. Earlier I briefly mentioned nitrous oxide as a global warming gas. This is a gas that has increased in our atmosphere since 1700s, but this rise has accelerated in the past two decades. It has a global warming potential 265 to 298 times that of carbon dioxide and can persist in the atmosphere for up to 100 years. It is produced naturally in our soils and oceans by microbes which transform certain nitrogen compounds into nitrous oxide. But now, nitrous oxide contributions from human activities are about the same as contributions from natural systems. This is because humans have added huge amounts of nitrogen fertilizers to soil and coastal waters, which have increased the amount of nitrous oxide produced by microbes. Nitrogen gets into coastal waters from the nitrogen-rich fertiliser. This dissolves in groundwater and runoff, which makes its way to our coastal waters. Smaller human activity sources include fossil fuel combustion, biomass burning and decay of livestock manure. I'm now going to talk about the impact of climate change on some of our iconic ecosystems, starting with coral reefs. Coral reefs are of great importance, supporting more than a quarter of all marine fish species and many other marine animals. In spite of only covering 0.1% of the ocean floor, they have the highest biodiversity of any ecosystem. They are being devastated by climate change, and as they are the start of food chains across many oceans, if they die out, it will trigger a cascade of extinction. Their disappearance will also have economic, social and health consequences, as they directly support 500 million people who rely on them for daily subsistence. They also provide protection for communities from flooding and erosion. We need to know a bit about the structure of coral reefs to understand how climate change will affect this beautiful ecosystem. Coral reefs are made up of tiny coral polyps, which are animals. Within these polyps are microscopic algae called zooxanthellae. There are millions of these living in one centimetre cubed of coral. These zooxanthellae produce pigments which give the coral their amazing colours. They also carry out photosynthesis, providing the polyps with oxygen and glucose. When water temperature rises, the polyps become stressed and expel the algae, which turns the coral polyps white. They are not dead at this point. Bleaching events can be temporary if the water cools, but the more frequent they are, and the longer they last, the greater the risk of irreparable damage. In some places, the bleaching events are so frequent and severe that the reef systems are fragmenting into isolated pockets. In the last three years, 
Bleaching events have caused 72% of World Heritage listed reefs to be exposed to severe and or repeated heat stress. Communities typically take 15 to 25 years to recover from mass bleaching. The scientific evidence shows that unless we limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we will lose 99% of the world's coral reefs within a few decades. Even if we can hold temperature changes to 1.5 degrees Celsius, between 70 and 90% of reefs will be lost. Another problem for coral reefs is the acidification of the oceans. The oceans absorb carbon dioxide. They are a carbon sink. This has slowed global warming, but it means that the oceans have become more acidic. Seawater is normally alkaline, but absorbing carbon dioxide makes them less alkaline, hence the term acidification. This acidification causes carbonate ions to be relatively less abundant, and coral polyps need these carbonate ions, as well as calcium ions, to build their skeletons, which are made of calcium carbonate. These skeletons grow upwards towards the sunlight and are also thickened to make them stronger. Ocean acidification slows down the thickening process, which decreases the density of the skeleton, making it more prone to breaking by currents, waves, storms, and boring and biting animals such as worms, mollusks, and parrotfish. Coral reefs also suffer from other effects of climate change, such as sea level rise, which will destroy reefs. Changes in frequency and intensity of tropical storms may lead to an increase in sedimentation, which smothers the coral situated near land. This reduces light available for photosynthesis or introduces pollutants which cause algal blooms. Altered ocean currents could lead to a lack of food for corals and affect the dispersal of coral larvae. I have been privileged enough to dive on many coral reefs around the world, but I have yet to experience the delights of the Great Barrier Reef. The reef occurs in the waters of eastern Queensland and extends for 2,300 kilometres. It is the planet's largest living structure and can even be seen from space. It is on my bucket list to go diving there, but I will need to get on with it sooner rather than later. A paper published in Nature in April this year shows that since 2016, half of the reef has been bleached to death. Much of the marine ecosystem along the reef's north coast has become barren, with 30% of the coral perishing in 2016, with another 20% in 2017. This brings me to the end of the second part of my trilogy on climate change. In the next instalment, during two weeks time, I will be looking at the impact of climate change on our polar regions.